Okay, so I haven't made a video on YouTube in quite some time. So I'm gonna try something different <laughs> with the Zoom filters on. Anyhow, um, so I like, I don't, I actually enjoy answering questions on Quora. So I won't go through all of my content. Uh, I wish there were more shares and comments, but it's fine. <laughs> like one of the questions I get almost every day is what should I do? And there's different variations of that question because I've answered a lot of questions. I think I have like 700 answers so far. Uh, let's take a look. I have 730, I think 38. I don't, I don't know exactly, actually, I don't look at it. Okay, yeah, so like, yeah, almost 750 answers. And because most of them are specific to entrepreneurship, I guess the algorithm keeps feeding me more questions on the topic. So even if I go to the request from today, I don't know if they, how their feed works, but you know, I am getting questions specific to space, aerospace, innovation, business products, which technologies will evolve over the next decade, innovation, routine, Uh, Elon Musk. Um, what does it take to turn out? Anyway, so I, I get the same question. It's a kind of some, so the, one of the themes is consistent. What should I do? What are the areas I should focus on? What are the areas that are gonna uh, drive growth? And the answer is simple. The world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. Um, so I figured I'd make this video because um, that's the, sh the, the sh long and the short answer. And so you start the Google search, right? And I, I talk about this. Uh, so I started with the Google search and I Google list of global issues, right? And you can try different variations of this. Uh, you may get different results. And it, it's also, contingent upon who you ask uh, or the resource you go to. And I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, uh, the different variations would mean list of global issues, list of issues uh, that humans are experiencing, list of issues that civilization is experiencing, list of issues that Western civilization is experiencing, list of issue that NATO is experiencing or the military uh, alliance that you are part of. So, uh, you know, you can like, so it depends on where you, where you want to focus, but I think, uh, how should I say this? I don't want my words to be misconstrued. Uh, the issue you want to solve, it should be aligned with your value system, right? So, so that's, that's really it. Uh, that being said, there are issues that impact everyone on this planet. And this is a start. Like this is not a comprehensive list. I, I wish this list, I don't know if I have edit privileges on Wikipedia because I don't have enough uh, like a social score there. I don't know if my entries get overridden. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Sorry about that. But, uh, yeah, which there was like a filter here whereby I could say climate change or human well-being and the data would reorganize itself based on the, the parameters that I am uh, choosing, right? So that individuals then, but, but like this, anyway, so that, that's what I would think would be a, a tool that you could leverage. So again, to, uh, to kind of backtrack, uh, I, I, I do get the same question again. What should I do? What are the issues I should focus on? And the answer is sure. Figure out what your values are. Figure out the impact you want to make in the world. And I think it should be an issue that has impacted you personally. Because, and I say that because if you felt that pain, then you wouldn't want anyone else to feel that pain. 
uh, particularly if the pain is in the avoidable category. Uh, so, you, you, you know, that, that includes access to clean water or the lack thereof, lack thereof or the following, shelter, uh, security, communications, education, healthcare, hygiene, uh, so on and so forth, right? So the, the, the key question is sustainability. Uh, if we could wave a magic wand and uh, have all of the issues solved uh, and you don't consider some of the uh, fun, fun, like core principles that you must focus on for the problems to get resolved, it could be uh, like you need to focus on sustainability is what I'm saying because uh, we, we can indeed provision uh, goods uh, and services for all of the people, but the, the question is at what cost, right? And so sustainability, uh, rights of the employees or, or uh, the workers and everyone involved in, in the whole dynamic, not just your employees, because it's a wider supply chain, uh, the impact to the climate itself. Uh, sustainability is a huge topic. All these are big topics, right? You must consider these uh, from the perspective of ethics uh, so that, you know, the, the ends do not justify the means, basically. So how you get there also matters, right? And so this is also tied in with, like, like going back to the topic, we, we can indeed uh, enable a world where everyone's uh, core needs are met. But the question is at what cost? You know, there's also the question of uh, freedoms. So do we want to create a world where everybody's needs are met, but there are no freedoms or there are like, uh, that's a spectrum between how uh, things are evolving uh, and they have been evolving here for a number of uh, centuries, I would think. I'm not an ex, like, I don't know anything about this topic. So I don't, I want to switch away from the screen because I don't want to include, this is an article on BBC. But the uh, question specific to freedoms has been, uh, okay, I'll switch here. Maybe that's a better, look, and this is a, all the Creative Commons licenses. The question specific freedom and uh, like, I guess different models are being tried right now with uh, in, in random order, uh, obviously societies that are free, uh, that have a long history of practicing and encoding freedoms and liberty within the core uh, aspect of their uh, being, uh, encoding the constitution practice. Um, and it's a spectrum. So between that reality and closed societies, there's a huge spectrum in the middle whereby you have uh, countries like the um, like United Kingdom. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I would put it in the same category as the United States in terms of freedom and liberties, uh, but it's definitely not on, and this is just a random spectrum, but it's, on the, it's not on the other end of the spectrum. So, you know, there's a history here with, with I think the fellow's name is Locke, L-O-C-K. Um, uh, but, you know, there's different schools of thought on how the structure of freedom uh, must be architected and, uh, you know, the trade-offs, so to speak. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a huge question, I, I feel, because as technology matures and evolves, uh, we're, we're on the cusp of, looks like, I'm not an AI fellow, but, uh, you know, it's going to be the core question. And not like Hal Finney apparently once said uh, that technology can either be used to oppress people in random order, or it can be uh, put in place to liberate people. And uh, I think he said computers. Uh, so Computers can either be uh, leveraged to uh, empower and uh, sorry liberate liberate people or oppress them. So it's up to us how we uh, choose to use that technology. So uh, making a segue uh, right now, my sense is I could be wrong, and on my uh, my this sub thought is influenced by one of the videos from Richard Taffel, 
but my sense is that we are living in a terrarium. Uh, it's a we live in a closed loop system, at least the way I perceive it. We could very well be living in, and I, I don't want to put this image saying there's like a divine hand involved or capitalism or anything. I'm not trying to make any references. I was just trying to find an image for a closed system. So like a completely sealed closed system. Maybe there's panspermia, maybe life is kind of interacting, biological life, uh, microbial life is interacting with each other in the wider cosmos. I don't know, but it, for, for, from, from my limited vantage point, it looks like we live in a closed loop system. Uh, and so everything that we've done uh, to date has only been on, this, on a singular planet. And we've had a lot of room to grow and expand into, uh, but, but the resources are not unlimited. And we are beginning to realize that with fossil fuel, with forests, with oceans, with uh, water, with uh, tip and lumber, um, uh, and other things, right? Uh, with the maybe uh, uh, lithium and other minerals, right? Uh, and you, so, so, so basically, uh, and without going to like the limits uh, side of things, um, but, but uh, the thing, uh, wh wh whatever is going to be the future of fossil fuel, uh, I, I don't know, right? Some people say peak oil already happened about a decade and a half, like at least a while ago, right? Uh, and others say it's ahead of us. I don't know what the, what the truth is. Depends on how many people are moving into the middle class, and uh, it's it's uh, uh, anyways. So depend, there's an efficiency angle to this. Without getting too much into like the limit side of things, I think it's important to kind of this is reality. This is this is this is what we're dealing with. Uh, or, or not dealing with, this is reality, that this is one of the many solar systems uh, in this galaxy. And there are at least 2 trillion galaxies. There could be less actually, D depends on how light kind of bends around black holes and stuff like that, which I'm not too familiar with. Um, but but we, we could have anywhere from, uh, I think it's 200 and like quarter of a quarter of a, uh, trillion galaxies, so 250 to 300 billion galaxies to 2 trillion galaxies, if I remember correctly. Uh, so the, the last time I checked it, the number was 2 trillion galaxies, but there are some papers that suggest that it's the number is lesser. But, you know, there's also that angle of how expensive is the universe. You don't know. So it could be a lot more than 2 trillion, right? Or it could be a lot less. So I don't know. But it, those numbers alone are significant, right? Any, anywhere from 300 billion to uh, 2 trillion galaxies with uh, an average, like, I don't know how num many number of uh, stars on average, but we're looking at at least 100 billion, maybe 200 billion stars per galaxy. So there's a lot of room, right? And, and if you think about this universe, that's like less than 10% of all the matter uh, sorry, less than 10% of all the universe is matter. So every, all the numbers shared so far, are like, but, but like, so I don't know how physics is going to evolve, if there's going to be warp drives and things like that. Uh, I think that's a conversation for another. Right now, I'm just talking about this solar system. And this solar system looks something like this. The solar system that we live in lives, uh, sorry, uh, looks look something, this looks interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the solar system looks something like this when it comes to the scale. We have uh, Earth somewhere here that's barely noticeable, but compared to the overall size of the sun, Earth is so fragile. And uh, Carl Sagan used to call this the pale blue dot uh, because that particular picture was Voyager kind of somewhere being really far away from Earth and looking back and taking a snapshot. And uh, that's where the term pale blue dot came from. I think Carl Sagan wrote a book on that topic too. Uh, 
Hey, I have the book right here. <laughs> yeah, so that's the book, pale blue dot, right? And like I've got the filter on to blur the screen. But um, the, 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 the only book I've read from Carl Sagan cover to cover is Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. And I read that about 15, 16, 18 years ago, some long time, at least 15 to 16 years ago. But um, yeah, I like a couple of books from Carl Sagan here, actually, which I haven't had time to go through. But uh, again, so this is the reality that we have a star system that is going to be uh, in the state that's in for uh, depends like I, 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 like I don't want to get too much into that conversation depends on the fluid nature of uh, the nature of the of like this galaxy that we live in right yeah let's see uh, what's going on with the spirals uh, what's going on with debris in the galaxy like uh, that's hypothesized in the movie Interstellar starting Matthew McConaughey and other folks uh we don't know right so that's another question in regards to like where exactly are we in the galaxy what's ahead of us um things like that right maybe there are some advanced beings who are leaving a trail of uh debris in their aftermath or some like other inter uh stellar uh natural phenomena happen so anyways all of these are different uh, questions but the, 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 this is reality right now. Like we know this for a fact that we have a star system that's gonna continue being this way for the foreseeable future. I think like a billion years uh, later, this earth is going to, like the, the star is gonna expand. So earth is gonna be in, not in the habitable zone anymore. But a billion years is a very long time. We, uh, it's hard to like envision what's going to happen five or six years down the road. So a billion years, man, I don't even have any, I, I don't have, no, I have no idea what's going to happen five, six, 10 years down the road. I, I, I feel the singularity would have already happened, the technological singularity. There's probably going to be contact with some other intelligences, whether uh, there are other technological singularities or anything like that. These are all like a 10 year level uh, hypotheses. I could be completely wrong about them. Billion years, I have no idea, <laughs> right? But I'm open, like I, I, I keep, like I, I wanna know uh, what others are thinking in that domain. So anyways, so, so the, the most logical and uh, reasonable thing to do, and I have a huge bias attached to this because we are deeply invested towards opening up the frontier of space. Uh, but the most logical and uh, the, the only thing we probably can do is to make use of the territory. Uh, I got to take a stretch break. But that's fine to keep going right now. Uh, is to make use of the territory. It's going to change the color right here. So, in this is, I think this is the territory that we're going to be in, at least from my limited vantage point and the very little I know about how things work. Could be some of us have opened up portals to other star systems and, uh, you know, it's like a, a layer of uh, reality that most are not privy to. And so like, I, but, but uh, I don't know that reality, so I can't extrapolate on that. But I feel based on what we know, based on what, like where we are at from a, so, somehow if all of the TRLs, the technology re readiness level could be uh, rolled up into some, some quotient, right? Some variable then that variable could feed into what I refer to as gradients uh, on the Kardashev scale. So that's a zero. Oops, 
That's not a O, that's a zero, right? I'm not saying hugs and kisses <laughs> or the other way around. Um, so yeah, so, so this will feed into that and this would then determine where we sit on the Kardashian scale, which is in a traditional sense, Kardashian. Um, in a traditional scale, the Kardashian scale uh, entailed the level of uh, energy a civilization can harness based on its technological, uh, what, you, what you call it, uh, let's take a screenshot here, uh, based on its technological adaptation or evolution, whatever you want to call it. So the levels start at one, two, three, but I would say it starts with zero really, which is where we are at. And uh, if memory serves me correct, uh, a level zero civilization is burning wood, right? Wood, fossil fuel, uh, hunter-gatherer societies, but basically, right? So we are, we're not, we're like, I don't know where we are exactly in terms of the quotient, right? So this feeds into this, but uh, yeah, yes, yeah. I don't know if I'm make, making it complicated. This is like more abstract than like super thought out. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Let me, uh, let me try to move this. Uh, how do you get rid of this? Oh, no, what's happening? Yeah, I, don't, I want to get rid of the stuff at the bottom. So I don't want to influence thoughts with the terrarium. But anyways, I'm just going to keep going. So we're like somewhere in, in here, like somewhere here, right? Because the type one civilization means you can harness all the energy falling on the entire planet. And I've made this comment before that considering that we're chopping a lot of the nature and turning it into wealth, we're basically chopping up nature and turning it into wealth. We have made machines that are incredibly efficient unbelievable machines we have created for digging the earth, for chopping down woods, for hauling the woods, for uh, moving goods, unbelievable efficiencies we've had in the past hundred plus years, ever since uh, the, uh, the engine, uh, like an actual physical engine, whenever it was invented, it took a, it took a while for it to start being leveraged for industrial applications and then automobiles. And then it kind of went on from there, went everywhere, right? And, and the, it, went, it went on the ground, it moved people, goods. It, it was, the Wright brothers figured out how to fly stuff. So now it's in the air, it's everywhere. It's under the, it's under the earth. So we're like, we're, we're, we're like, we've created these incredibly efficient machines which still run on fossil fuel. But what we're doing is we're turning nature into wealth. And however you slice and dice it, whether you look at it from the limits perspective uh, or uh, the abundance perspective, uh, I, I, this, is, this is a dynamic that's a problem, right? So, so I, I don't know, maybe, maybe quantum, computing, quantum computers could help solve this problem. But I would think like, however you look at this, what, anyways, let's come back. So I was talking about the Kardashian scale. So scale, but somewhere between zero and one is where we're at right now. If we, if we just go to uh, Kardashian scale one, that looks like a cat, <laughs> maybe Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> if, we, if we go to, uh, Kar no, no, no Schrodinger. If we go to Kardashian scale one and we're doing nature into wealth, then that's not a good uh, thing, right? Because you can do some systems modeling and that's not gonna be a good thing. So I, I feel like we need to be at scale two already. And, and I, I'm here, like I, I'm saying we should be at scale three. So scale two and three are, scale two is a, uh, the ability to be able to harness most of the energy. And I'm going with a limited definition of the Kardashian scale. This is not completely encompassing the sun, but you get the point. This would be Kardashian scale two, right? Oops. Kardashian scale two. 
right? This would be Kardashev scale one right here. That was, this is what I'm proposing. So I'll just say P for proposing, but we are kind of like here. We're not here, but I'm saying if we get to one, that's gonna be bad because of this. And number three would be the galactic scale. So I'm gonna draw this out somewhere here. Say this was this, our sun. And there's billions, hundreds of billions of suns like this. And apparently there's a super massive black hole here. There's black holes of different sizes all around. And there's a spiral galaxy. So, but anyways, the galaxy looks something like this. I don't know if the spirals actually go this way around, but you get the point, right? Something like this. And there's like so, the, so there's like, again, hundreds of billions of suns with who knows how many planets in the galaxy. So this would be a type three. So the traditional Kardashev's model would entail that it's the ability to be able to harness energy from the physical locale. So planet entirely, one, the entire sun, two, the entire galaxy, three, right? And a type four would be, I guess, universal, and a type five would be maybe extra dimensional or something like that. I don't, I don't know if, if extra dimensions exist. So, so now the question is, um, yeah, like so, my my thinking is type one is going to be a disaster if we just focus on type one. For the for the, I I can't I should be challenged here. So what I'm proposing is that this is the space that we should focus on. There's a lot of space here. And focusing on this space will get us, uh, the natural outcome would be abundance. We're not gonna be in a scarcity-based society anymore. Uh, not only can we provide for, we can provide unlimited, like not unlimited, like all exponential growth for uh, some number of years. I don't know what they're going to be, right? Uh, depends on how the population increases, depends on what we choose to use the energy for, uh, and so on and so forth, right? But uh, provided there's no life, um, and there's different schools of thought on what should happen here. Somebody asked me recently about Mars. Uh, I'm getting like mixed uh, up uh, and my sources are limited. I don't follow Mars related news often, but one group says there's no life there. There's some other reports they said that from the Mars Society, which I attended some of the programming, I attended most of it, not all, probably 50% of the sessions that I viewed but other individuals suggest that there are signs of life on Mars, bacterial life, maybe other life on Mars, right? So the same is being said for Venus. They're saying there's signs of, they, they kind of went back on the whole phosphine thing. They, there was a kind of excitement around that because you can't, phosphine cannot be produced from uh, geological uh, activities. So it has to be something in the biology that creates it if I ever, but then that turned out to be uh, uh, not a thing. There was no phosphine then. And now they're saying there's life there again. So I don't, I don't know, right? But I think like the future is in O'Neill colonies. Stanford Torres' O'Neill colonies that are gonna be scattered around. I don't know which orbit you're gonna place them in, but you could place them around the planet itself, right? Not, I would say not on Earth, uh, not in Earth's orbit. Uh, I don't know if you could actually position them in some orbit where they wouldn't collide with Earth or any other planet at that, causing a huge cascade of uh, like a, a big problem, right? Anyways, the synthesis of this section is that this is the real state, which is potentially going to be I, not potentially, this I think is going to power abundance for the next couple hundred years, maybe thousands of years. It depends on uh, how you, again, choose to make use of that energy. Let's take a screenshot. But 
This also has an angle with computation, uh, which is a conversation by itself. But contingent on how computation, uh, our computational systems uh, evolve, that would give us the ability to be able to make sense out of reality and potentially come in contact with other intelligences out there and potentially be able to make sense out of the communications that are coming our way. Because uh, I don't think the contact situation is going to be something like a Jodie Foster movie. It could be. Or like an Amy, Amy Adams movie where like um, octopi, octopi are coming from another part of the galaxy. And one person is decoding their language. It could be. If Newton could single-handedly change the course of history or... Anyway, so I, I, I would think you would need computation in order to be able to make sense out of the uh, 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 information being, being, being beamed uh, towards you or you just found. Because even if there are like subtle differences and as it relates to intelligence, say that there is an intelligence out there that is active and communicating, or maybe they just left like some kind of relic behind. But that relic could mean like, it could solve all of our problems, right? Um, but even if there's a subtle difference in intelligence between us and some intelligence, that could be like, that could change a lot of things for us. And it's like, there's, there's definitely that question of whether we are ready to be in possession of technologies like that. That's, a, that's the question. That is such a, a good and important question because we just got to take a look around. We got to take a look around our planet. We got to zoom back in and see what's really going on. How are we treating each other? What are we doing to each other? What are we doing to the animals? What are we doing to the environment? You know I mean? There's a diff different schools of thought on what ought to be considered as spiritual growth. And man, I can't speak about that. I'm not in the capacity to judge anyone. I'm not passing judgment. I'm just saying we just got to take a look around and ask ourselves if we are ready to be in possession of technologies that are a lot more advanced versus technologies that we are accustomed to. And these, I think these are important questions, if I may. So, so this is, I, I feel like this is where we're gonna be for the next couple hundred years, provided contingent on how computation uh, evolves. So if the computational abilities evolve to a state whereby we are, like I would, I would say like, uh, I, have, I have a whole series of like sub thoughts with regards to like where you place the technological singularity of the timeline. Because if you, if you only operate from the mindset that the technological singularity, which is a subtopic, nothing to do with like what we're talking about, at least I don't think so. At least I wasn't thinking about that. But if the uh, technological singularity, I don't want to draw that right now. Uh, we, 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 we always, like everyone you kind of poll, they always say it's like, there's the joke, right? Technological singularity is going to happen 10 years from when the question was asked. But then there's like the actual set of predictions where it's like there was a consensus of 2045 and then the, the, the range was all the way from 2045 to, the, to 200 years out. Uh, so now the range is like 10 years or less to 200 years out, right? But the question I pose, what if the technological singularity on earth from earthly activities, from human-based activities, something that ha already happened, right? So I'm gonna let you think about that and ponder on that and also think about the repercussions of something like that. So if the technological singularity is something that's already happened, then reality is a lot more clearer than it was already was. And uh, so the question is, what kind of questions are you gonna ask? And the asking of those kind of questions would then determine your future and this is a huge conversation with regards to mental models and memetics and how we uh, exist, how we evolve, how we, how we are. And uh, huge, huge implications if the technological singularity has already happened, right? If it has already happened, we know for a fact that 
it's not a event that uh, I, I feel like what we like uh, my my gut feeling is the categorization of uh, exponential technologies as now nah, 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 I gotta I gotta refrain because then all the technologies are gonna get lumped into that but. On, on the topic of superintelligence, there is a uh, concern that it could uh, cause huge problems, cause could cause the extinction of humans. But uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to do justice here. My my sense is there are already intelligences out there in the constructs, like not just the universe. Maybe there's extra dimensions. Maybe there are other universes. Uh, space time could have different variations. So I don't know much about the many worlds hypotheses, but my sense is that they're already intelligences and they're on different gradients and they coexist, right? And so uh, I was reading a little bit about uh, uh, Plato uh, and, uh, or, or something to that effect. And three things that they were talking about were the pillars were ethics, logic, and uh, physics. So, um, and, and that's been my intuitive gut feeling without even like, I didn't go too deep in the philosophy side of side things uh, or stoicism at that. But I would think if intelligence already exists, then they must have an ethical framework in effect. And it's the degree to which that ethical framework is exercised uh, is what determines how the whole thing works, right? Uh, and I'm going to make a comment and it may seem a little, uh, it's not very well thought out, but it would be weird if consciousness or cognition, however you experience it, I don't know if one exists or the other, it's a different school of thought on what those words actually mean. But whatever we're experiencing right now, if as we're experiencing, it would be very weird if this was only experienced in this universe it would be very weird like i would just like like i'm like what's the, but but if you start exploring the uh and, and, and the making of that comment right now i don't think means anything other than the possibility that there could be other intelligences out there because that's where you're exploring now right but, uh, or maybe we are the only intelligence in, in period right and that would be also very weird like how right but if you explore again so kind of going back and forth but if you explore the other end of the spectrum but the, the question is and and uh, you know people who study the cosmos have, have made this comment the law there, there are laws in effect but how do these laws really come about and we don't know right i don't i don't know because based what we know is limited to how we observe the universe. And so far, none of the instrument, instrumentation has been able to pierce outside of this universe, the boundaries. We don't even know if there's a boundary, all these other questions. But anyways, uh, can, this can go in a lot of different directions, but I wanna bring it back here. And it's definitely abstract. I wanna, I wanna take it back here to the terrarium. Let me say, let me go back here. I think I took a screenshot, but I'm just going to take another screenshot and then I'm going to clear this out. And uh, so specific to the terrarium and I got to get rid of the drawing thing here. How do you do this? And okay, okay, yeah, okay. Wait. So, because one of them was overlapping the other, it seems. Anyway, so right now we're on this terrarium and my gut feeling is a little controversial, but we are kind of like eels or crabs or something like that. So when I go to the grocery store uh, where they have the live seafood, I feel bad, man. Um, I eat chicken and fish, but I feel bad for all the fit, like the, the, uh, the lobster and the crab and I don't eat octopus. Uh, I don't recommend people eat octopus. They're very intelligent creatures. Uh, I've seen some other people say that as well, like in the past couple of years. I stopped eating octopus a while ago. It's been, it's been a while. Uh, anyway, so 
So we're, we're kind of like, we're, we're like, I don't know if we're conscious, first of all. So it's, it's that's a whole set of, my work should not be misconstrued. <laughs> I, I hope people ask me questions as opposed to making assumptions. So I'm not saying humans are dumb and, you know, like unconscious being, do whatever you want. I'm not saying that. And what I'm saying is that our unconscious actions are, uh, you know, I think we operate on different levels of awareness and I'm not judging anyone, um, but it's kind of remarkable that in spite of these unconscious uh, behaviors, and I think memetics has a big thing to do with it. Uh, we operate on different levels of awareness based on our heritage and uh, the that the, the, you can see this with uh, the enablement of science. Uh, science it's, it's, it, it, it gets enabled in certain cultural uh, segments versus others. Uh, again, my comments should not be taken out of context because we care, I care a lot about the world's indigenous communities. I feel it's very unfair that our unconscious actions are putting the world's indigenous communities in the harm's way. Because if the climate does change and if it changes rapidly at that, then the world's indigenous communities who usually are not in the fold of civilization and live in remote areas could be most vulnerable. And so uh, again, that's why I say people should ask questions and not assume things. But uh, but but right now what's going on is we have this limited kind of mindset problem on the world, and uh, we're kind of like some creature that are kind of toppling over each other, uh, and we just we're just trying to figure out like next day, next week, next this, next that, and we're not focusing on the bigger problem. And it looks like a long introduction. It would, it would, this would take me a while to jot down in, as part of my thoughts. Uh, and it could be a kind of like a brain dump also in order to be able to write a book or something to this effect. But, um, but yeah, when I write long answers on Quora, people ask me questions, but anyways. So, so the big problems are coming back to the big problems. The big problems are big opportunities. And so going back to Quora, people, you know, I, I appreciate others are asking these questions, but the answer is simple. The big problems are the big opportunities. You know, the venture capitalists who have spoken about this. If you're working on a small problem, like I don't know what that could be. Uh, you gotta, I think you should ask yourself, why are you not working on the big problems? And what, like, then you gotta work systematically in order to be able to eliminate the fears, uncertainty, doubts, something else that may be standing in you solving, you and, you and your team, watch this, solving the problem, right? And so start with this list, see which is the area that you wanna make an impact in. And just go forward, jump in, and start solving that problem. Um, my prediction is, and uh, going back to the image I drew, my prediction is that the abundance is real. You know, Dr. Peter Diamandis has been the source. <laughs> you know, he had he was one of the first people I kind of read. I read his books. I followed him online for a long period of time. I don't know who else came to this realization and who else spotted these patterns. So he works quite closely with Ray Kurzweil and they were, I think the first to spot this trend that sure that that's going on, this is going on. And these are the ways we get our information. And that's what, you know, that's what this is, this, this, this is projecting. They cut through the noise and got straight to the source and, and they were able to connect I feel like the right dots, if I may. 
And we're definitely heading towards a world of abundance. And the question is, what's, what, what, what level will we choose to be at? And I, I, I've made my point, right, if I may. So it's, it's, it has to be level somewhere on level 2.x or maybe 3.x. So we, as we become a 2.x civilization, we become then a, we're planting the seeds of becoming a 3.x civilization. Now there's different schools of thought going back here. I wanna go back here. I'm gonna go back and forth a little bit. There's different schools of thought on how there should be a categorization of the Kardashian scale, right? So we're going back to the Kardashian scale again. The first one is just space. Sorry, so the first one is energy in a, in a traditional Kardashian scale, right? I think Robert Zubrin, I feel has a take on this. So he, uh, Mr. Zubrin is of the opinion that it should be the land mass that is, is under the domain of that civilization. Uh, so uh, I didn't get too deep into it, but um, I think it's a territorial thing, right? I, I could be wrong. So if you look at from the physical land mass, we today have the capacity to be able to almost go anywhere on earth, right? Depends what you mean by that. If we just talk about the surface, and uh, being able to send a drone there or some machinery with a finite amount of time, then we can probably cover 100% of the earth, air, land, waters within a finite amount of time, right? As well, including the ability to be able to dig a little bit into the crust and maybe send something there. Um, so in that sense, I would categorize as, as a type one civilization from a space perspective, not an energy perspective, right? Uh, so it now say, if we now built a complete Dyson sphere around the, uh, the sun, that would make us a type two civilization, right? From both an energy and space perspective, right? I have these thoughts and uh, I, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm still thinking about this because I don't know much about neuroscience uh, or cognitive systems at that. But I feel we are who we are based on the uh, layers of abstraction that have been enabled uh, based on what I think is evolution. Uh, it could be that aliens have something to do with our evolution. I don't know, <laughs> but I don't wanna take, like, take that tangent right now. But we are different from chimpanzees. Uh, not that much when you look at our uh, genetic code, but we're different, very different from chimpanzees when you look at our overall behavior. And we're very different from chimpanzees when you look at the layers of abstraction that have enabled uh, in our brain in order to be able to give us computers, electricity, the ability to, be able to go from city to city, sitting in like a one ton vehicle, which is highly inefficient. But anyway, so that's another conversation. We can fly, we can go to space, we have quantum computers. These are the, you know, things we have enabled in a span of about a 10,000 year time span, which is not a lot of time, right? And the pace of change is kicking, kicking, like, uh, kicking in, like it is going faster. But all, all, like all of this is enabled on top of layers of abstraction. So this is another school of like a sorry, line of thinking, but maybe the Kardashian model should be thought of in terms of the layer of abstraction that a species or intelligence can enable. But difficult it is to do that because how would you, how would you even define that, right? Because when it comes to energy and space, you can run the map, right? It's not, it's, it's not um, the, we have that level of affair, awareness now with our instrumentation in order to be able to do something like that. Uh, 2000 years ago, we may not have been able to do that. At least with the telescopes and whatnot were not developed. You know, we're still, uh, much had to be said, said 
uh, when it comes to uh, the placement of our existence in a, in a wider reality. But also like roughly about 2,000, 2,200, 2,400 years ago, some folks had incredible, incredible insights. I'm not trying to like draw a correlation here. I just like reading up a little bit on the, cause I was reading up on Plato and others. And, uh, some, some folks had remarkable insights that, uh, you know, like there's the, like another reality and this reality that we experience is, is like uh, emergent from that. So, and now we're learning about quantum mechanics. So it's, it's really interesting that the Greeks were thinking about quanta and like this other base reality, just like the quantum world. Man, I just like wonder what was going on in their minds for them to be able to think thoughts like these. There was something very special going on with the Greek uh, civilization, I I'm thinking. But anyways, to, to, to come back to this topic, uh, I feel there's like a, a, like a la different layers, if I mean, <laughs> of abstraction and these layers of abstraction uh, I feel are the reason why, uh, sorry, I, I, the layers of a, 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 a extra, abstraction would I feel be the, be, but could be the way, right? But it's difficult to explore this with our limited brains. Anyways, I just wanted to uh, explore that a little bit. So co to come back to the question, like I get, again, this question a lot. So these are the problems to solve. You know, this is not a comprehensive list. I would love to see some more human rights uh, related. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, initiatives here. And uh, it's, you know, it's got this column here for the relevant UN directives. Uh, I've only attended like a few uh, events hosted through the United Nations. And I must say the quality is, the bars is really high. The events are really, really well uh, managed. They have just, I just only have good things to say. And uh, historically, like going back 15 years, something like that, 10 years even, I heard some other folks say that the United Nations is a bankrupt organization and change is not gonna come from the United Nations. And I don't know, man, uh, when you actually engage with people, like folks from like, so I've not engaged any, with anyone directly from the United Nations, but I've spoken to like the areas that I'm interested in. I'm interested in disarmament. Uh, I don't wanna see uh, heavy weaponization in outer space or in on earth at that. I think we should get rid of our nuclear weapons. I kind of went back and forth on that topic because on one side it helps with the disarmament aspect, sorry, it helps with the uh, deterrence aspect that uh, there's not gonna be a break, a break out of like a large scale war. But on the other hand, it could end humanity uh, on like uh, in an instant, um, could cause a nuclear winter, could cause nuclear famine. It could put civilization in a tailspin, potentially in a situation where uh, civilization could not recover from. And for those reasons and more, I kind of went back and forth on this, but I'm, I'm against the nuclear uh, weapon aspect. But that's not my final stance because what if you need that weaponry in order to be able to uh, blow up some big rock coming our way, right? So I don't know, these are complex questions, but I don't, I don't know. And I like, so, but I just, like, I do feel that we have a lot of nuclear weapons on this planet, enough for us to do, uh, to create that dynamic, like situation, that dynamic that I, um, I was speaking about, uh, could put us in a, in a path of like extinction. But yeah, so these are the issues. I haven't gone through all of these issues, obviously because this is a list that I kind of stumbled across last year in the past six months or so. And uh, there's definitely human rights related uh, aspects here, uh, but I think it's not categorically called out because like you look at women, right? So it's like under democracy or international law or, okay, or right, there's the category. Like, you, you see what I mean? It's kind of spread out. So. Uh, you know, uh, there's nothing for trans. 
folks who are transgender, right? There's nothing for, a, there's no, there's no such thing. Gay rights uh, doesn't look like, right? So, yeah, there's nothing. So, there's no animals. Uh, protection for animals. Uh, maybe. Uh, there's nothing for indigenous people. So there's there's a lot there's a lot of uh, areas that should be highlighted here. Yeah? Must be highlighted. So there there are different there are different uh, sources uh, to come back to this. There's the United Nations list. And then there's the World Economic Economic Forum list, and then there's a Global Environmental Issue list. And I don't know what the source for this is. The other two are connected to explain themselves. So going back to the questions, like when I get the questions, people ask me. And the answer is again is simple. I've repeated this a couple of times. The biggest problems are the biggest opportunities, right? And here's the proof. So housing is is an issue I think about a lot because I haven't had. Uh, I don't want to get into the details, but I haven't been able to afford a house for a decade almost now, right? And I'm not doing a finger pointing thing. I just take the ownership. I decide to go on a path of entrepreneurship and I had to uh, make this choice to be continue to be on this path or uh, be on a comfort kind of path. Uh, maybe it's a little unfair to do real enable the spectrum like this. Um, but yeah, housing is something I really feel like housing, mental health, uh, issues of human rights. Uh, food, food is a big one for me. Uh, being able to afford quality food. I don't like putting junk food in my body because I've just seen a lot of people who are physically and psychologically sick uh, because they don't uh, take care of their nutrition and their well-being. And I'm not saying this to make anyone look bad. I've just tried to share the feedback and just haven't seen the changes. So, but the, the unfortunately or fortunately, the behaviors of others was a stark warning for me to focus on my well-being. And it's to come back to the list and the opportunities. All of these areas are big opportunities. And like, like, like there's definitely stuff that's lacking here. So if like for housing, right? Like housing is not here on the list. But if you run the number, if you like ask Google how many people do not have adequate shelter, that's like more than a billion and a half people on the planet don't have adequate shelter. And yet that issue is not on the list of global issues. And how many people do not have banking or financial services? That's like 1.7 billion people. Same here, right? Like when you search for that, well, that's not on topic. When you search for that, that's not financial equity should be on this list, affordable housing. So on the topic of affordable housing, when I did the numbers, because I was exploring it from the perspective of, well, this many people and, uh, I did a review for, I'm not promoting a startup, but I guess I am. I don't get anything out of it. Uh, I am connected to one of their investors through LinkedIn, but I've never actually spoken to them. They just added me because maybe I made a, because uh, I, I do believe that Boxable is doing something that could change the world. They're really going after like a really big problem. And I feel they could solve this problem because everything about them makes me want to say that. So, but when I did the numbers for Boxable and I went with a base price of $50,000, I just simply multiplied 1.6 billion because that's how big the market opportunity is with $50,000. And the number that we get back is 79, more than $79 trillion, trillion with a T. And so this is just one, Sorry about that. Sorry about this. Excuse my manners. Um, this is just one example of how big that, that the opportunity is. 
Do you hear me? I just want to, I just want to categorically uh, say this, that these are huge, massive giga, or not even giga, but this is our, Okay, anyways, I can't do the market, right? These are huge opportunities. The numbers speak for themselves, right? And uh, this is my short video for the for the day. I got to go get some tea or something. But this is my short answer. The world, or well, not an answer. The world's biggest problems are the world's biggest, biggest business opportunities. So go forth and change the world, man. No, sorry, yeah, gender neutral statements. Go forth and change the world. All right, there's nothing stopping you. If your intentions are good and you are disciplined, you can force the discipline. You can follow people from the military, from law enforcement and other areas to learn about that, right? If you don't know how to plan, you can do the same. Find somebody who is good at that and learn it. If you have mental health issues, you can talk to a mental health practitioner. If you have addiction issues or borderline addiction issues, you can take the steps in order to be able to create a new brain. You got to be really compassionate and uh, you got to love yourself in order to do that. If nobody around you believes in your vision or your dream, then you can take the steps. I guess I could take off the filters, <laughs> but you can then take the steps in order to cultivate that within you. And you can also take the steps to distance yourself away from folks who bring you down, who, uh, you know, they have their own issues. They don't know how to deal with them. You can recommend them to a mental health practitioner, but you cannot change others, right? So be mindful of that. Be very mindful of this. Uh, be mindful that there's all kinds of energies in our world and you, you want to attract positive energy, right? And last but not the least, everyone has issues. You have issues. I have issues. Uh, I've had issues in the past. You've had issues in the past. Nobody's perfect. And I feel it's going to go a little off topic, but I feel we are unconsciously creating a reality whereby we, man, just let's, let's keep it simple. Invest in your well-being, invest in others. Uh, sorry, invest in their well-being and invest in others if you if you want to. Uh, how you choose to invest is up to you. Time, energy, could be something else. It could be uh, if you want to invest or uh, what else. Yeah, man, that's it. Okay. There's nothing. There's nothing stopping you. Um, uh, just don't take on too much of a controversial stance that. United Nations is like a disorganization or that or or anyone at that. Uh, you know, focus on forgiving others, be compassionate. Uh, focus on your own shit. Like, don't try to like uh, you know. There's already enough problems in the world, so the world doesn't need more problems. So it's my my sincere advice to you, and I think the Stoics also talk about it is focus on your well-being focus on your own development and uh i also recently saw a video from uh robert green being interviewed a kind of dialogue between robert green and ryan holiday and one of the things they were talking about there was a very good video i can see if i can link it up in the description one of the things they were talking about was ambition and uh i really feel this that you, and i'm not like trying to like anyway so uh, if the ambition is not coming from a good place, it can cause a lot of bad things and cause a lot of destruction, right? So ego without restraint, if it's not humbled, if it's not coming from a good place, can cause enormous destruction. And so it's so important to really do the inner work. You know what I mean? Like when I talk to my friends or my acquaintances, I talk about this over and over and over again. And I keep saying this, that, you know, I put a high variable, I'll say 80% of the work is inner work, but I would say it's 99% probably, right? 99% of the work is inner work. I feel that the possible futures already exist. I don't know how this reality works. 
but I feel the possible futures are already there. And I feel the possible future we're heading into, it's really good. It's exponentially good. And exponential change is very different from linear change. So the reality we're heading into is really good. So the question is, how must you change yourself for you to enter this new reality, right? And I feel that I'm not trying to set myself up as a thought leader. That's not my intention here. But I do feel that what people have been told in the past may not work for them for them to be able to transcend into this new reality because the new reality is full of love, compassion, understanding, helping each other, forgiving each other. Uh, I think these are the things you would have to do in order to be able to shift yourself into this new reality because the new reality is already here. It requires for you to do the things to be able to change yourself so that you can operate potentially with other intelligences. And so, uh, you know, we, we have to like rethink everything, like how we do everything pretty much. And that's a huge conversation. But anyways, I got to go. This is my short video for the day. Uh, the gist is go forth, change the world. Starts with changing yourself. That's going to be 90% of the work. I feel, I was thinking about this. I should have written this down because I've been an entrepreneur for, uh, depends how you look at this, for nine years almost. And in these nine years, I've realized that the thing I had to change the most was myself because the opportunities were there for me all this time. The money was there. The resources were there. Everything was there, man. The technology was there. I just had to change myself. And I'm not saying I've changed. That's it. Time work is done. It's going to be a continual work in progress. I had to go through a lot of change to be able to be honestly in a position to make this video. Again, it doesn't mean that, you know, the work is done. I'm going to go and sip a, like a pina colada now and just say to others, you got to change yourself and I don't have to change. Everyone's got to change and you got to keep changing. But I am really grateful that I came across the right teachers, the right resources, like books, <laughs> right? Um, uh, the people with the right mindset, the growth mindset. I learned about the growth mindset. I learned about deep work. I learned about other things, like in philosophy now, not historically, more recent, the past couple of months, uh, for past couple of weeks. And I was just able to turn inwards and ask myself, how do I need to change? I learned to love myself. I had huge questions about my identity. Uh, I mean, identity is such a multifaceted question. I'm not going to be able to talk about that in this video. And as I was going through this change, I, did, I do feel like I got a lot of resistance, uh, which turned violent in uh, a lot of situations. But uh, I, f I forgive everyone, man. <laughs> I'm not laughing at this. I forgive all those who hurt me in some way. I have no grudges. Uh, and I did that because I also had to go up to others and ask for forgiveness. And I didn't know what they were going to say. Uh, and it was very scary to go up to somebody and ask for forgiveness when you don't know the outcome. And uh, it looks like I was forgiven. Uh, so I think I was forgiven. Uh, so that's why I forgive easily, I guess, because I also have been forgiven. And asking for forgiveness was a difficult thing to do. I must say, I'm kind of repeating this a couple of times. But uh, these are my honest thoughts. I, I feel they're my honest thoughts. And uh, what was I going to say? What I'm saying is that if you want to change the world, you got to change yourself. And 
when you're going to change yourself, you're going to realize that everything you need to live a happy life is already around you. You just got to change yourself. Man, I, 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 I think I can speak more about this, but I got to go and change myself. <laughs> so you have a nice day and we'll talk to you later. Send me more messages on Quora or find me whoever, wherever you can. I always have 15 minutes for you, whoever you may be. If, if I haven't answered that question before somewhere and you think I can help you in some way, then I will be here. I only ask that you just do the same, that you employ or deploy or uh, uh, integrate this same uh, mindset whereby you go and help others. If I'm giving you 15 minutes of my time, you should go and give somebody else 30 minutes of your time, at least 15 minutes of your time. That's only fair, right? So just pass it forward, pass it on. All right, thank you very much. Keep sending me the questions on Quora and have a nice day. Bye for now. We'll stop the recording.